critique of natural illusion. Every unmasking critique knows itself to be in an intimate relation with what is really the case below the surface. On all sides, human consciousness is invited to deceive itself and to be content with mere illusion. For enlightenment, therefore, it is always the second look that is decisive, because it overcomes the first impression. If things were generally as they immediately seem, investigation and science would be superfluous. There would be nothing to look for, look through, or look into. But science and enlightenment have a detective-like relation to reality. The tension between the search and what is given is particularly radicalised in the case of human and social phenomena. For here, everything that is given, gegeben, is simultaneously, in a certain way, only ostensible, vorgeblich, and artificial. Human life moves a priori in a natural artificiality and an artificial naturalness, plesna. This realisation is part of the great achievement of Enlightenment's reflection on culture. It shows that human beings, as they are, live unnaturally. What was natural in them was lost and became distorted and misshapen through civilization. Human individuals are never in the centre of their beings, but rather stand beside themselves as persons other than who they really are or could be. These insights are today common knowledge in philosophical anthropology. In the meantime, they have been morally neutralised and have become detached structural viewpoints. At the beginning of this discovery, however, the thought of unnaturalness possessed enormous value for moral attacks. Its explosive power was great as long as the belief in a good nature seemed to be unshaken. One of the battle cries of bourgeois society during its uprising against the aristocratic world order was Nature! Nature! One can see the consequences of this discovery of unnaturalness in Rousseau's critique of human beings and society. It possesses both a critical negative and a utopian positive side. One could also say a destructive politics and a constructive pedagogy. Pedagogy? Hmm. Rousseau diagnosed a total degeneration, a complete fall of humanity from the nature and the society of the 18th century. All spontaneity had been denaturalized through convention. All naivety had been replaced by finesse. All sincerity had been glossed over by facades of social intercourse, etc. Rousseau's eye for these things was excessively sharp in a way that only an offended bourgeois perception, wanting to register its rights to life, could be in an aristocratically fabricated social order. The social theatre of the ancient regime was becoming more transparent and absurd every day. Whereas the aristocracy treated its own form of life with irony, bourgeois cultural values, Gemutskultur, treated the artificial convolutions in that form of life with disgust. Consequently, Rousseau's critique met with tremendous approval from his contemporaries. In his depiction of social denaturalization, not only did the up-and-coming bourgeois feel confirmed in its most elementary social feeling, but also the more sensitive part of the aristocratic intelligentsia knew itself in the main to be correctly portrayed in this critique. Here the universal law of sensitive critique applies. The critique is accepted by those who, in any case, are less touched by it, but its main targets seem to be looking into a blind mirror that says absolutely nothing to them. The agreement of intelligent aristocrats with Rousseau's critique was an important catalyst for their philanthropic activity, with which they tried to buy off their guilty consciences after benefiting from the status quo. The first rational debt psychology, as mentioned earlier, was indeed an offshoot of aristocratic Rousseauianism. What came to light in its healing procedure could be taken from without further ado as proof of the inner healing powers of nature. 
the possible destructiveness of the unconscious and the dark side of nature first came to the notice of the following generation of romantics and were interpreted in an increasingly conservative pessimistic way. See E. T. A. Hoffman, Joseph von Eichendorff and many others. A political stance follows directly from this analysis. In the name of the natural against the system of compulsions, on the side of the bourgeois honest heart against aristocratic artful deceptiveness, on the side of the free social contract against the old feudal relations based on coercion. The new society wanted to be an order in which all agreed to their mutual advantage on the peaceful and diligent life together according to a model based on nature and mutual sympathy. As harmonious and affable as that sounded, some representatives of the ancien regime were still sensitive enough to hear the insurrection of hell in this programme. With horrified satisfaction, conservatives saw the French Revolution degenerate into terror and war. Nothing since then has nourished the conservative image of humanity more strongly. It thinks it knows the hu that human nature, set loose here and now, deserves no optimism or glowing phrases. Conservative thinking in this instance behaves positivistically. Without first asking about context, it notes all too often, human beings behave egoistically, destructively, greedily, unwisely, asocially. Indeed, for this reason, criminality was and is so extremely important for all types of conservatism because short-circuited thinking finds in it the final proof for a pessimistic view of humanity that, in turn, provides the basis for an authoritarian, strictly disciplining politics. From this viewpoint there exist in nature criminals, idiots, malcontents, egoists and rebels, just as there exist trees, cows, kings, laws and heavenly bodies. The Christian doctrine of original sin here joins forces with the conservative, pessimistic understanding of nature. According to this doctrine, human beings, simply because they are born of woman, live in the world as defective creatures. Rousseau's philosophy sees all this in advance. It knows that one has to get around pessimism by demonstrating how human beings become what they are socially. That there are human beings who behave nastily, greedily, unwisely, destructively, etc., proves nothing about their essential being. Here, in Rousseau, we find perhaps the most important figure of thought in moral political enlightenment. The theory of the innocent victim. The evidence introduced for political pessimism, the criminal, the lunatic, and the asocial individual, in a word, the second-rate citizen, these are not by nature, as one finds them now, but have been made so by society. It is said that they have never had a chance to be as they would be according to their nature, but were forced into the situation in which they find themselves through poverty, coercion and ignorance. They are victims of society. This defence against political pessimism regarding human nature is at first convincing. It possesses the superiority of dialectical thinking over positivistic thinking. It transforms moral states and qualities into processes. Brutal people do not exist, only their brutalization. Criminality does not exist, only criminalization. Stupidity does not exist, only stupefaction. Self-seeking does not exist, only training and egoism. There are no second-rate citizens, only victims of patronisation. What political positivism takes to be nature is in reality falsified nature, the suppression of opportunity for human beings. Rousseau knew of two aides who could illustrate his point of view, two classes of human beings who lived before civilization and consequently before perversion the noble savage, and the child. 
Enlightenment literature develops two of its most intimate passions around these two figures, ethnology and pedagogy. To the present day, nothing has essentially changed in this approach. Literarily, this double passion precipitates two extensive genres, exotic travel literature and later ethnology on the one hand, and the educational novel and the literature of pedagogy and child development on the other. The primitive peoples about whom the European explorers from Columbus to Bougainville and Captain Cook reported provide an enlightenment, which was gradually becoming more political. The urgently needed evidence for its view that roughly stated things can proceed differently. Peacefully, reasonably, humanely, sensuously, without aristocracy, without war, without exploitation, without wigs, without letter de cachet. The noble savages in the South Seas are like an Archimedean point through which one can playfully dislodge the claim of European social orders to be ordained by God and therefore unexallable. Something different does exist. At the same time it is better. What is reasonable can thus also become real. That is all enlightenment is trying to say. From this moment on, the child becomes a political object, to a certain extent the living security deposit of enlightenment. The child is the noble savage in one's own house. Through appropriate education, care must be taken in the future that innocent children are not made into the same artificial social cripples the previous system produced. Children are already what the new bourgeois humans believe they want to become. Enlightenment was not the first to politicise pedagogy. It has discovered, however, that children always, and everywhere, are the future security of existing relations. But now children are something more. They carry bourgeois hopes for another world, for a more humane society. It also appears as if, for the first time, a new politically tinged form of parental love has been developing concentrating in the wish that one's own children should finally have a better life. Only in a society that felt the shake-up and that committed itself totally to the dynamics of world change and progress can such a form of parental love prosper. A new amalgam of love and ambition for the child is thus formed, something that would be meaningless in a stable, stagnant society without prospects. Peasant societies do not envision careers for their children. They see no prospects other than that of life as a peasant. Ambition in the aristocracy is directed not for the benefit of the child, but for that of the aristocratic lineage itself, the family. Bourgeois children are the first to have an anthropological and political mission. How the traditional directing of ambitions in the bourgeois parent-child relationship is currently changing could be the topic of a special investigation. Of course, Rousseau's optimistic naturalism has a very vulnerable point. The beneficence of nature is something that can be doubted even when one does not hold conservative views. In the beginning, things were not all that idyllic. Genesis, Ursprung, is downright severe and difficult. It soon becomes clear that the image of origin cannot be understood historically, because on closer investigation one finds that war, inequality and harsh conditions of life are widespread in an unyielding nature. There are exceptions, but they can scarcely be interpreted as origin and rule. It becomes more and more clear that this idea of origin has not a temporal, but a utopian reference. The good is still nowhere to be found except in the wishful human spirit, and in daydreams, which unerringly aim at something, even though it does not yet exist. Thus, critical naturalism can survive only when it withers away, and reawakens as the spirit of utopia. The origin then serves as an end vision. Bloch. Naturalistic thinking, in fact, fundamentally changes its function in the 19th century. 
the natural sciences provided a concept of nature that, had, that was anything but idyllic, especially since Darwin, the bourgeois order, having become imperialistic, used the beast of prey as its political emblem. Nature was used as justification by those who needed to legitimate acts of violence, not by those who spoke for peace. The heraldry of the old aristocracy had also shown a striking sympathy for predatory animals. The eagle, falcon, lion, bear. Long before Rousseauianism, and in substance opposed to it, there was an aristocratic naturalism that was renewed in the bourgeois order when it became powerful as political biologism. Nothing can show more clearly that Rousseauian naturalism had been only a momentary stylization of the conception of nature on which a general theory of liberation could not support itself securely. Hesitatingly, therefore, Enlightenment began to take leave of the noble, savage and innocent child, a parting that, of course, can never lead to a complete break, Bruch, with these allies. The child and the savage are beings who have a claim on the sympathy of those who remain true to the idea of the Enlightenment. Impulses for self-reflection and the great civilizations coming from ethnology even today. Thus, behind the conspicuous present-day cult around the American Indian, there is a good deal of pondering about ideas of nature and the maximal size of societies that want to maintain a reasonable relation to themselves as well as to their environment. And from child psychology there is still today a steady stream of valuable impulses for reflection on the behavioural patterns in societies that suffer from their unresolved childhoods. What has remained undamaged in Rousseau's critique is the indispensable exposure of a supposedly evil nature as a social fiction. This remains important in the purportedly natural inferiorities concerning race, intelligence and sex and sexual behaviour. When conservatives and reactionaries refer to nature to justify their assertions about the inferiority of women, the lesser capacities of dark races, the innate intelligence of children from the upper social strata and the sickness of homosexuality, they have usurped naturalism. It remains the task of critique to refute this. Ultimately, critique must at least be able to show that what nature gives us has to be recognised as neutral and non-tendentious so that every value judgement and every tendency can without doubt be understood as a cultural phenomenon. Even if Rousseau's good nature has been discredited, he has at least taught us not to accept bad nature as an excuse for social oppression. However, when one speaks of the victims of society, the artful dimension quickly comes into the picture again. In the concept of the victim of society, there is a reflective contradiction that can be misused in many ways. Already in Rousseau, a dubious artfulness is observed that is supposed to conceal a double standard. That he combined nature and childhood in a new idea of education and, at the same time, denied his own children and stuck them in an orphanage, has long been understood as a discrepancy between theory and practice. Rousseau was a master of an artful reflexivity that skillfully found fault with others on every point, but in itself always discovered only the purest of intentions. On the white page of this feeling of innocence, the famous confessions were written. In this posturing there was something that other determined enlighteners above all Heinrich Heine, could not and did not want to follow, even though they do not have anything to do with the notorious defamation of Rousseau by the entire counter-enlightenment. The vulnerable point in the victim theory is again the self-reification of consciousness, the establishment of a new naively artful position, this can serve or be felt, depending on the circumstances, as a diversionary trick, as a technique of extortion or as indirect aggression. Psychology is familiar with the eternal victim who exploits this position for disguised aggressions. Also belonging to this category in a broader sense are those permanent losers 
as well as medical and political hypochondriacs who lament that conditions are so terrible that it is a great sacrifice on their part not to kill themselves or emigrate. On the German left, not least of all under the influence of the sociologized, sociologized schema of the victim, a certain type of renegade has emerged who feels that it is a dirty trick to have to live in this land without summer and without oppositional forces. Nobody can say that such a viewpoint does not know what it is talking about. Its mistake is that it remains blind to itself. For the accusation becomes bound to misery and magnifies it under the subterfuge of unsuspecting critical observations. With the obstinacy of a sophist, an aggressive self-reification, many a critical consciousness refuses to become healthier than the sick whole. A second possibility of misusing the victim schema has been experienced by dedicated helpers and social workers when, guided by the best intentions, they try to make prisoners, the homeless, alcoholics, marginal youth and others aware that they are the victims of society who have simply failed to offer enough resistance. The helpers often encounter sensitive resistance to their attempts and have to make it clear to themselves just how much discrimination is present in their own goodwill. The self-esteem and need for esteem in the disadvantaged often forcefully defends itself against the demand for self-reification made on them by every political kind of assistance that argues in this way. Precisely those who are worst off feel a spark of self-assertion, whose extinction would be justifiably feared if those concerned began to think of themselves as victims, as non-egos. To preserve the dignity of poor bastards, they alone, and on their own accord, can say that they are poor bastards. Those who try to put such words into their mouths insult them, no matter how good their intentions may be. It is in the nature of liberating reflection that it cannot be forced. It answers only to indirect assistance. From this vantage point, the perspective on a life spent in total, unavoidable benightedness becomes possible. Theodore Adorno, Theodore Adorno sketched this when he spoke of an unhappy consciousness in which the down and outers inflict on themselves a second time that wrong that circumstances perpetrated against them in order to be able to bear it. Here an inner reflection takes place that looks like a parody of freedom. From the outside the phenomenon resembles satisfaction and would, if addressed, probably also refer to itself that way. In memory of his mother, Peter Hantke, his found a tender formulation in which the sadness of a loving and helpless knowledge lays down arms before reality. Self-contented unhappiness. Enlightenment has neither a chance nor a right to disturb the world's slumber if it looks like this.